I'm uh, very excited to be here today and to share with you a little bit about uh, a research project that we've just kicked off. So you're aware Cochrane has this new fabulous research integrity team. And what we're showcasing today on behalf of my collaborators is a new project that falls within this realm of research on research integrity. This is very meta, but this is part of the agenda of the research integrity team to advance the evidence around how to actually improve research integrity, looking at issues, understanding them, and then hopefully to propose solutions. So I'm going to present our work uh, that's under development, looking at preprints and comparing them with final publications uh, in terms of research on COVID-19. So next slide, please. I'm here presenting on behalf of my team of collaborators. This research is led by Professor Lisa Barrow, uh, Stephanie Lawrence, or, sorry, Stephanie Botton, who you'll hear from later today, our research staff, Rosa Lawrence, Kelly Chu and Sally McDonald, Matt Page presented earlier today, and Robin Featherstone is our fantastic librarian. Next slide, please. So the objective of our project is really to compare outcome reporting and also the presence of SPIN in COVID-19 studies published as preprints and then comparing to the subsequent peer-reviewed publications. In recent years, in the before COVID times, there was a new preprint server launched called MedArchive. And this project aimed to increase the kind of uptake of open science principles by publishing preprints ahead of peer review. There was some discussion in the early launch of this around some of the ethical issues that might arise with publishing particularly health and medically related studies before they had gone under peer review and quality control, essentially. And then COVID hit, and we have since seen an explosion in the posting of preprints, particularly related to interventions related to COVID-19, and really a high uptake of preprints within media and scientific reporting within the public. And this has raised a lot of issues, particularly as some of the most widely shared preprints turned out to be for conspiracy theory type things like the fact that SARS-CoV-2 was perhaps lab created, um, others have been retracted. And so there is some question about whether there are important discrepancies between peer prints and peer reviewed publications in terms of the comprehensiveness and completeness of their reporting but also issues around selective reporting or reporting that perhaps is more favorable than the data warrant. Next slide, please. So we uh, have available a wonderful resource through Cochrane, which is the Cochrane COVID-19 registry. This is really unique in that it is grouping a number of records by study. So when you search this database, you have access perhaps to the preprint, to the protocol, to the published report. So we are looking to sample studies that have both a preprint and a subsequent peer-reviewed publication. As you imagine, the sample is constantly evolving as uh, publications come out. We're looking for studies that have an aim related to treatment or management or prevention specifically. So there is a world of diagnostic and prognosis, prognosis studies, epidemiological and health services research, mechanistic studies. We're excluding those for the time being. And we're specifically looking at studies that have an interventional or observational design excluding for the time being modeling and qualitative studies, as we don't really understand how to operationalize concepts like SPIN particularly well with these designs. So currently to date, there are 19 interventional studies and 15 or 50, sorry, observational studies in the registry that published a preprint and have subsequently been published following peer review. Next slide, please. 
So the primary outcome that we will be evaluating is looking at particularly the consistency of outcome reporting between preprints and peer-reviewed publications. So we'll have particular attention to the number of outcomes reported, whether they specify a primary and secondary outcome, and of course, whether they switch. For each reported outcome, we'll look at the outcome domain, the measures, metrics, method of aggregation, time point, and sample size. We'll look at the actual data reported and the statistical significance of the result, but then also we'll attend to how data are presented in terms of tables and figures. And so we're, we're specifically measuring consistency. It could be, in fact, that the preprint and the peer-reviewed publication had terrible incomplete reporting or that both were quite thorough. We're looking to see if there's change between the two. Next slide, please. Our second primary outcome is specifically to assess the instance of spin in the conclusions of the abstracts and full texts of preprints and peer-reviewed publications. So when I use the word spin, we are referring to specific reporting practices that distort the interpretation of the results or mislead readers so that results are viewed in a more favorable light than the results would warrant. And this can happen intentionally or unintentionally. And we're concerned about spin because it potentially leads to hype or skewing of a research body toward interventions that are thought to be favorable when the data don't support that interpretation. We previously had conducted a systematic review of studies that assessed spin in biomedical research and had developed a typology of different types of spin that occur across study designs. So we've since developed a coding tool for spin that is applicable to both interventional trials and observational studies that pertain to treatment management or prevention. Next slide, please. So we're in our next steps, we are going to register our, our protocol with the Open Science Framework. We are using REDCap, which is a tool for survey research, but we find works really well for these sorts of content analyses. We have our team of eight investigators working in pairs to extract data from these pairs of preprints and studies. And we will be looking at the types and frequencies of the discrepancies in this outcome reporting, comparing preprints to the publications, and then also the proportion of abstracts and full texts that contain instances of spin. Next slide, please. So Stephanie and Lisa are leading this research. You're welcome to get in touch with any questions. But I think as we are finding, preprints continue to have a front and center position in the reporting on COVID-19, and we're really interested to understand the implications for open science and research integrity. So thanks so much. Quinn, that was fantastic. Thank you very much uh, for that update on a hugely important project. Um, I'll give a few moments for any questions to, to come through. Hopefully we'll have uh, one or two to, uh, to, to focus on. Um, Whilst we're waiting, perhaps I might I might venture one question to you. Sure. Um, how would the so with the interventional stuff, you're looking at seeing these trials that might have been read or were uh, available as preprints. Will you take the protocol, sorry, the the trial registry records into account as well when you're looking at the um, the preprints and onward to the publications? So at the moment, I believe that the comparison for the outcome measure will be strictly between preprint and published study. I think that's a, a lovely benefit of the COVID-19 registry that Cochrane has put together is that if protocols are available, they'll be tacked on. But at this time, there's a large body of literature that has looked at things like outcome switching between the protocols and the peer-reviewed studies. And I think we know that is an issue. We know there's there are patterns and associations associated with that. So our focus here is really with um, preprint. And I would venture to hypothesize that given the time frame and, and the rapid nature of COVID-19 related research that I think it would be interesting. We should, I, I don't know, I have to check if we've added that as an aim to see if they've actually registered a protocol and the timing with the preprint. Cause I, that would be, I think really interesting to see. Yeah. 
Fantastic. Okay, thanks, Quinn. It seems uh, it seems that we haven't got questions for you. So, uh, Quinn, thank you very much for your time. Um, Fantastic. Thank we'll you. We'll be moving on now to uh, Ruth. I think. Who oh, sorry. Here. Just oh. just one second. We've got uh, Gerald with his hand up, so I'm going to unmute oh, him. Apologies. Now. Okay, Gerald, you're unmuted. Ger Hi, uh, Gerald Catalina from Cochrane, Austria. Um, Hi. Will you also look at the proportion of preprint articles that never gets published? Yes, that's a great question. And we've we've gone back and forth on that. Um, at the moment, we will not be doing that in the first phase of this study. Um, and simply because I think we would need to have a much more longitudinal focus. Um, it's given, I think, how quickly COVID research kind of has proliferated and come out. We don't have a good sense of um, like what what the curve would look like, how quickly you can expect a, a peer-reviewed publication to follow. So I think we will be tracking that. We have access to the registry, and that may be then a subsequent phase of the research, particularly, I think, if those preprints got a great deal of attention in the popular press outside of academic mm -hmm. conversations. Um, and I, I think that's a really important question because if we're circumventing peer review, essentially, I think we'll want to pay particular attention to the spin and the reporting practices in preprints. Mm -hmm. And maybe a, a follow-up question. Spin is highly interesting, but uh, if there are quantitative differences between preprint and actual publication, they could have an impact on a meta-analysis, on a systematic review. Will yeah. you look into this? Yes, absolutely. So with our first primary outcome, where we'll actually be comparing the reporting practices, we'll also be recording actual discrepancies in terms of, say, the significance of the results, if that changes between preprint, peer-reviewed, the actual results reported, uh, whether outcomes have disappeared or been added, and also the presentation of data in the tables and figures. So absolutely. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, in the meantime, Quinn, and a question has been posted from oh, okay. uh, Abbas. Ruth, hold fire for just one moment if I can uh, get you to do that. So, um, so Quinn, when is so Katie Abbott has asked about hmm. when the research will be con uh, concluded, uh, timelines for you, uh, and dissemination. Yeah. That's a hard question. So we're 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 moving forward. So we're about to uh, begin our data extraction. We're committed to doing this in a timely fashion. I would I would assume that um, we would have some preliminary results in the next couple of months. I think I guess our team is going to have to discuss whether we post a preprint, um, and then be very careful to assure consistency with our peer-reviewed publication. Uh, but that I, if, I think these results will be really timely and, and really exciting. So we'll have to figure out how to to get them out in a timely fashion. So I'll I'll maybe leave that to to Lisa and Stephanie to to keep you all posted. Thank you, Quim. 